big influence on uh, on you and on people around you uh, and, and the game. So where's that come from? Um, you know, punk is driving a lot of the sort of indie stuff. Uh, what does heavy metal drive? Um, so I started listening to heavy, like heavy metal back in the early 80s and haven't stopped. And uh, so that that's the kind of music I listen to all the time. Like I, I could, uh, even even at work, I would like be listening to, uh, you know, any kind of heavy metal group. But I could sing it and I could just pound out 6502 code without even thinking. It was really you know, just like that, they were tied together. And um, and then like making games like Wolfenstein or, or Doom or Quake, it was a lot of Alice in Chains and Black Sabbath and you know, just just a whole bunch of metal stuff. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, usually when I was trying to, I got, I got a little bit better later with the Doom and Quake where I would try and listen to the kind of music that I wanted to influence the level design. So if I wanted to make a level that was kind of like epic or maybe medieval, like try to listen to a certain type of song, like maybe like really early Queensryche or something that, that kind of gave the, the epic feel, like Roads to Madness or, or No Sanctuary or something, you know, that, that would give you that kind of feel that you want, that would help to create a really medieval castle or something. Um, so I'd always try and listen to the thing that would influence me, you know, try and get into the zone of, of the level, the level uh, creation of, you know, dimming the lights and turning off everything, turning on metal that was the kind of sound that I wanted, whatever the feeling of the music was, I wanted to try and make that feeling come out of the level when the player was was experiencing it. So I tried to do the get into the zone kind of thing with all of my level stuff, but not really with Wolfenstein. With Wolfenstein, it was just fast, aggressive, metal type stuff. Right. Um, so I mean, do you feel like you were part of uh, the, the uh, kind of metal community? I know you have done some stuff with uh, some artists, and um, there's also the infamous uh, launch at uh, Lime Lake. Uh, which was uh, pretty, I don't know if you want to talk about some of those uh, moments, but. Well, um, I don't know, We the limelight was the, uh, the Doom 2 launch. Which is a club in New York that was in a kind of gothic church. Yeah, it was a church. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Um, that was on October 10th of 1994, and that was, that was the first time I think I'd seen 3D with uh, like sitting in the air in front of you. And I haven't seen any of this since. It was like some weird projected 3D machine that they had brought in. So they, they had like echo demons projected in the air that you could wave your hand through. It was really crazy. I don't know where that tech went. Are you sure that was there or was that? <laughs> 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 I've been to the limelight and I've seen some pretty crazy things too. I'm not sure it was technology. It was a cool, it was a really cool <laughs> Um But yeah, the, uh, the uh, yeah, music had always, had always been tied to like I don't ever do anything without music. So like the fact that I'm sitting here talking without music is kind of weird. <laughs> Usually like video game music or something. Um, but uh, but yeah, I always listen to music all the time as I just you know uh, trying to trying to create games. And out of the four of us that did, uh, Adrian and I both listened to metal all the time. And, and it was like Tom and John Carmack who had different tastes and, and it was great because we basically had a rule where each day was a person's day and they could play anything they wanted all day long and everybody else had to listen to it. And so it was really good for everybody getting used to everybody's musical styles and, and all that. Um, and I heard a lot of stuff there's no way I ever would have heard <laughs> on my own. Wow, what did, what did Carmack listen to? Carmack, uh, he listened to a lot of like, uh, he really liked Prince and um, Concrete Blonde, Iggy Pop, uh, some Queen. Uh, he he was, it was so funny. There was um, there was a lawyer that was uh, that, that used to have an office next to us, and, and late at night we we crank up our, our music, and I had an office right next to John, and so I'd be listening to my stuff, but I but I was kind of in an inner inner office, um, and John his office wall touched the next office next to us. And so late at night, one night, uh, you know, he was listening to, to Prince, and I was listening to, to a bunch of metal. And I heard the door, the beep on the front door, kind of go off. And then I was, I thought maybe he he left or something for a minute. Um, and then uh, I heard his volume kind of turn down, and so and then somebody walked past and the beep again. And I went over, and I was like, "What's going on?" And I, 
you just turned on your music, what was that all? I just heard some beeps. And he said like the lawyer next door came over because he had a client over there like eight or nine o'clock at night and he was playing Prince. He was playing that shaking month, shaking that ass. <laughs> and, and just like got that guy super pissed. And, uh, and I was like, what's he doing coming to our office? That's super rude. So that lawyer was gone and then we... Yeah, I would have gone to file a Wow, interesting. Um, so I, I kind of want to um, uh, take a moment here to shift gears and uh, you know, one of the kind of topics is the archive and I'm super fascinated um, with uh, the work you're doing there and um, by the fact that the archive is not like your typical game archive, where you're actually archiving uh, uh, just digital video games, um, like Henry Lowood's uh, collection, which is amazing. And these are all really important um, contributions to the history of the field and to studying and learning about games and being more critical about um, games. But your, um, I mean, the, the Romero archive is really meant to kind of chronicle uh, game design. How, how you archive game design, that seems really... Yeah, so uh, what I do is I, I'm trying to go back to the beginning of the industry, because those are the people that really need to be interviewed before the later people, because um, they're getting older, you know, they're older than the other people, <coughs> like today. <laughs> and, um, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, to uh, I'm trying to capture the design process that these pioneers went through when they were when they were coming up with these these games, um, you know, back in 1980, 1978, you know, 82, um, people that that all they did is code in assembly language and try and basically interview them on on videotape. I'd basically be interviewing them and I would ask them um, extreme details down to instructions even on their games um, about how they did. How they did their games and why they did them, and what were what, what was special about the parts of the game that they were, that, you know, like I played all the stuff that, that I would be talking about, and um, and asked them specific questions about parts of the development of it so they could try and answer it. And you know, even now, like it's 2010, and it's hard for these people to remember back to 1980 and, and the specifics of what they did back then. So I'm trying to do this as soon as possible. Um, but what I do is I get on tape, I, you know, I get on video and I'm trying to um, kind of walk them through the process from the very beginning. How did you get interested in computers to kind of cover the very beginning? And then um, what they learned and, uh, and then as they were writing stuff, how they went about coming up with ideas. Where were the ideas coming from? Was it another game? Was it a movie or whatever? And how they synthesized that into, the, into their own ideas. Um, so just trying to get like where did these things come from and how did they make them? How did they develop them? Um, because some of that information might be useful to people today and in the future, you know, like, oh wow, he took that idea that I didn't even know existed, you know. Um, kind of, uh, I, I just saw Wall Street 2 last night and uh, one of the interesting parts of the movie was that like Gordon Gecko is, is like the most awesome finance guy ever, you know, he's just kind of sitting in the background, but he knows so much. It's really interesting, you know, he knows a lot of stuff, and, and one of the things that you find out in, in the movie is that there was a thing called tulip mania, a long, like, 1500s or whatever, that was this crazy thing that is analogous to what happens on Wall Street, and, and that's like, just knowing that is interesting, you know, it's interesting to know that this thing happened a long time ago, and what caused it, and maybe that is something that, that kind of trend could be applied to like now from the future. So I'm kind of thinking that, that maybe there's some information that, that we're getting from these pioneers that people could could use. Um, well, I think that's interesting. I mean, you go back to um, tulip mania and the origins of the stock market and the Dutch trade and things like that. I mean, if you think about the history of games, though, um, and I guess I guess this is what I, this would be um, uh, something that would distinguish the archive. Too, but uh, you know, games have existed uh, for millennia, right? Yeah. Uh, prior to video games. So, it, does the archive begin with digital video games and end there? Is it just going to be about the sort of design process? Well, right now, right now, I'm focusing on digital video games because a lot of the stuff that came prior to that, because <laughs> people aren't around. Um, oh, or not, but even unknown, who designed? Uh, you know, yeah, Senate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, it's like there's the really old old stuff. But yeah, if I can get some pinball guys, definitely I want to get some, some people to pinball. Be uh, interesting to interview electromechanical designers. Um, I think that's one of the interesting things: electromechanical, like the, the, the modern day arcade cabinets that we're using are are, are an artifact of electromechanical games because. If you look inside of an arcade game cabinet, there's just a tube and there's like a motherboard on the ground and there's all this empty space on the inside. And that's because they did change the, the cabinet manufacturing from electromechanical games where I actually needed all the space inside of the thing to actually make the game work because there was no video screen. Um, but yeah, like that kind of like, where did, who came up with that idea, you know, to have a cabinet and you know, what was the first game to do that and you know, to talk to that person, that'd be really great. Um, I guess I want to uh, sort of uh, push you a little bit further in this direction of um, thinking about um, origins of video games and their forms and you know, linking pinball, um, but also ask you a little bit about some of the newer games that are coming out. I mean, even represented here at Indiecade, uh, some of the big games, um, uh, games that have won awards at Indiecade uh, last year, uh, Brenda's game. Uh, uh, train at one uh, an award, um, and, and I think um, a lot of the kind of interesting things happening today are happening both in digital games and in um, non-digital games, so I guess the question would be, um, would that be something that you would include? Um, yeah, totally, that, that, that would be stuff that would, that would go in there as well, especially a game like Train. You know, how did you come up with the idea, and what steps did you, like when you were building the track, you know, what made you do it this way and, and all of the details. Um, so that's, you know, basically that, that game, all the, all the really interesting games. Um, but what I'm trying to hit is the oldest and the most influential people. Um, and it's also, it's also interesting to me, uh, I get a lot of information from people who own game companies. Those are the people who actually have an unbelievable amount of information. They probably don't have a lot of programming inform information, but they have the whole network in their heads of what it was like back then, and the business side of it, which is which is interesting to see how the business has changed over the years. Um, but there is a huge difference in talking to um, a, a 6502 you know, programmer who did a really interesting game, and then talking to Doug Carlson, uh, the guy who created Burger um, Bun. And that's those. That's very different kind of information you get from these two people. But it's also super, super interesting. And a lot of you know that information. A lot of it is just it's not out there in books anywhere. So I mean, in, in addition to uh, videos, who have you interviewed so far? Please, uh, Sid Meier, Chris Crawford, um, Robin Norm, Serotech. How long are the interviews usually? Um, well, there's like the there's like the first wave of interviews, and then there's like going back and having to interview them more to kind of get up in the years. Like with Don Daglo, uh, I was excited to make it to almost 1982, and that's right. after like two or three hours of, of interviewing. So they're they're usually like hours, and they'll end up being. They have like, these long careers, right? Yeah, really long. Uh, and there's, you know, every every company, uh, every game company back then could have a massive book written about it because of all the craziness that happens in there. Um, and just trying to get some of that on video, you know, uh, because there's a book probably won't be written about it. So at least trying to get some of it captured on tape would be is, is the usual thing. I mean, what? How do you um, decide what what should be in, in the archive? I mean, that seems to me to be a curatorial decision that yep. is <laughs> you're making, or yeah. yeah. Um, Typically, um, like my interest has always been the Apple II side, but but I'm also uh, I'm also interested in the other platforms and the uh, the games that, that had influence on those platforms, um, such as uh, like say Warren Robinette who did uh, Adventure on the 2600. He also created Rockies and Boots on the Apple II, and he created the Learning Company, which is a big, huge you know game company or educational company back then. Um, and so talking to Warren Robinette would be, you know, would be great. I'm actually friends with them, I just gotta find time to, to sit down with them. But, um, but that's like, there's a lot of information that would come from talking to Warren about all the stuff, because it kind of covers Atari, it covers Apple, it covers the learning company, um, but say Synapse Software, which is really like an Atari company. Um, I would be, I would, I would want to talk to the people that, that, that made games like, like William Otaga and, uh, you know, uh, Bill Hales, uh, or Steve Hales, um, you know, and also the, the founder of Synapse, 
um, the totally, you know, time bandits for the ST, you know, so all these games that were 